we can show some of our other uh, personal images as well. We should probably move to the object, which is arguably one of the most beautiful in the sky, but is stops you taking images like that. Um, and I, of course, mean our, um, our Earth's uh, natural satellite, the moon. One of the largest satellites orbiting the Earth. One of the largest in the, in the moon solar system, it, yeah. In the absolutely. way that Gateway Arch is one of the largest arches in St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, the, the moon is still up there. Right? I can't remember. It's like the third or fourth biggest. But it's actually one of those. It's one of those celestial bodies that is really rather interesting because, of course, everybody gets to see it at some point during its cycle um, in, a, in a given lunar month. Uh, you know, as you rightly said to me the other day, except during new moon, so we're getting you know, a plus amounts a day of new moon. Of course, nobody can see it, and it's in direct line with the sun. Um, but it's over over history. It's it's dictated an awful lot of our of humanity, from of times to harvest, times to go hunting, um, times of fertility, um, and of course in, in modern times for us as astronomers, it's it, it, certainly in the optical it can be a real pain in the derriere because it's so so bright. Yeah, you basically can't do any uh, deep sky observation when yeah, the moon's out. That's right. No, no deep, no no deep sky. <laughs> So, and I know we should probably throw up an image or two, but you and I have actually taken photos of the moon, and some of them are pretty darn good, even though I'm biased. I'm you have a spectacular lunar eclipse uh, composite um, they took. Do you want to tell us about how yeah. this one, how you made it, like uh, the, the, the big, what, what this is representing? Yeah, this is a beautiful image. You put together the composite, so I, I, I thank you for that. It's only actually four images, but you, you mirrored them, um, sort of top left and bottom right. And I took this uh, on Cape Ann here in Massachusetts. Um, it must have been a year ago, maybe two years ago. There was a lunar eclipse there. And I can't remember where I was. I was out near um, Plum Cove, um, which is the backside of Cape Ann here. And it was nice and dark looking out over the ocean. Uh, and so what you're seeing in the very center is uh, a total lunar eclipse, or very, very close to total at least. And what essentially you're seeing is the shadow of Earth is passing onto the surface of the moon. Um, but it's not you don't it's, you don't you're still seeing something you're not seeing nothing, and it turns out what you're seeing is is Earth shine. So you're seeing the reflected light from the Earth plus some rays that are going through Earth's atmosphere and still illuminating some part of the surface. So just a and, uh, beautiful. Is the Earth shine always present, and we can just see it during a lunar eclipse, or does it only occur during a lunar, lunar eclipse? No, that's a really good question. I think the answer is no. And I think you you will have seen this yourself. When you see very, very thin crescent moons just after a full new moon, so you're typically seeing this very, very sort of tiny crescent in the sky, you can often see uh, Earth shine on the remainder of the moon. It's not just dark. You can actually see the moon behind the crescent, um, but uh, obviously not very brightly. And that's, that's Earth shine shining onto the dark surface of the moon. Um, so very, very beautiful. I and mean, then these other three images, let's say, let's go toward the bottom right, is this looks to be in near half eclipse, uh, three quarter gibbous eclipse, and then obviously uh, the full moon, but with no eclipse. So this this progressed as the, the eclipse was, was uh, being observed. And then the other three top left are just mirrored from the bottom right with a 180 degree uh, translation rotation uh, algorithm. But it's just a nice wee sequence that I, taught, I took with a, a DSLR, um, with I don't know what the aperture is. It's probably four centimeters, maybe. It's a it's a really uh, sort of I, based on the resolution you had here. It looks like you probably went out to three hundred millimeters for the focal length. Yeah, I was talking about the entrance aperture. Oh, yes. the oh, aperture. Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. No, the, yeah, not the focal length. The entrance aperture yeah. is is probably you know, forty millimeters across, something like that. Um, but yeah, this is probably long, uh, long focal length. But just beautiful, just a beautiful set of images. Um, and you, you have another one that I took, a, a, yep. oh my gosh, about 15 uh, years ago now. Um, uh, sorry, uh, this one, amazing. This one. Now, this is a very beautiful image. It has a nice story behind it. So uh, I don't I, I don't think, I don't think this was, where was it? I think it was. I think it was a, just a three-quarter gibbon, so not far off. And this, believe it or not, is through a telescope, a large telescope, actually a one-meter telescope, uh, but the with none of the back end optics, in fact, that we had just finished installing it. I want to say just finished, right? It was a six month process. Um, and we this was the very first object we we looked at. It's called a first light image. And uh, believe it or not, it was taken by pointing a, um, um, a telephone. I can't remember what type of telephone that was. You know, maybe an, an, an Apple Four or Apple Five. It was it was fifteen years ago. I can't remember the exact telephone. And we just pointed it up the. Um, the entrance aperture to the telescope, and this is what we, we took. 
Um, and it's the telescope is the educational telescope on top of Mauna Kea called uh, Hoku Kea. And it was while I was a professor at the University of Hawaii in Hilo. And we built this telescope specifically for the educational program there um, at the university. But it was one that it was one of the sort of smallest aperture telescopes on top of Mauna Kea, but uh, produced this beautiful first light image. So I really enjoyed this one. Slow, one of the smallest apertures on Mauna Kea is kind of like saying one of the slowest receivers in the NFL. So like it's still going to be pretty big, it's still right? Decent. Yeah, still decent. That's right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah the this is, this could... is the telescope that you built with like your bare hands, basically, right? Well, I think I think that's a slight exaggeration. Though. I mean, I didn't build it with my bare hands, but um, it was it was it was built by a company out in Golden, Colorado. I don't know if they're still operational, actually. I can't sure I can remember their name. But um, yeah, they they built the 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 hardware, the superstructure, you know, polished the mirror. Um, the dome itself, I did it, it was built as with a, a local contracting company, but I did I did put, put that up with my bare hands. There's telescopes of me tightening things down and you know, point, pushing the crane to install various parts of it. So that that was good fun. Uh, Fourteen thousand feet to do that is is pretty tough because your breathing is a little bit labored, you know. But yeah. um, did you have to wear an oxygen yeah. mask or anything? No, no, you just get on with it. I drove up every day and uh, did it, and then drove back down to sea level. And uh, this was when Benjamin was Benjamin had just been born, actually. So Benjamin, you went from fourteen thousand feet to sea level every day. Yep, every day for about two years. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a hell of a drive. And uh, yeah, get home and feed Benjamin and stick him in the bath and give my wife a or ex-wife, I suppose now, uh, give give do her your, a break. Do your evening hypoxia vomit and then uh... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, like breathe in as much oxygen and for, for the next morning as possible. Hold and, your uh, breath for uh, eight hours. Yeah, that's right. Give give give, give me. Well, if I was holding my breath, I wouldn't get the oxygen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I love these stories, the especially like the, this one because uh, you have so much astronomy street cred, like because you like you oh. built these telescopes, like you were a professor of uh, you know astronomy and astrophysics, and and you uh like you you have this incredible um this incredible like history with the subject. You're just you're one of the most qualified credible people in the world to speak on this stuff and i, I hope you guys i hope you guys out there appreciate it. you have access to this dude's mind like he is this is a very it's not very this is a special thing you, we, we, we we all get to appreciate for me man you're amazing thanks man i appreciate it don't make me blush but uh, i don't think it's a, <laughs> i feel like gandalf right it's not a function of being clever or intelligent it's just you've been around so long you just pick things up you know <laughs> <laughs> and and also you died and came back as uh david the extra white oh that's <laughs> right yeah he was it was he gandalf the gray and then gandalf the white david, yeah david the british <laughs> david the, david the welsh there you go yeah. david the welsh <laughs> well i've always loved the moon in fact i think when i first got into astronomy you know this was when i was about seven i think i told my mother i loved astronomy and she she bought me this small aperture telescope this sort of little two inch uh, diameter uh, telescope and of course the very first thing that one does is you look at either the moon or saturn right the saturn's got the rings like you can see behind you this beautiful ring system or the moon because it's super obvious that when you look through the moon you see craters and mountains and craters in craters and oh i was, I was just blown away and so i said mother i'm going to be uh, become an astronomer or an astrophysicist and i was about seven she's like oh, okay so she bought <laughs> some books and no, she was super supportive it was, it was very nice and, uh, so I've always loved the moon. Always loved the moon. And we'll, uh, we should show some of your photos too, or some of the other collages we put together. But one of the things that really, uh, where, where does this one come from? So this is um, with uh, my Celestron 6SE. It's a six inch oh. aperture with, I think, a thousand millimeter uh, focal length. And it was using a DSLR um, in, into directly into the visual back. Beautiful. Look at that. Look at the craters there on the bottom left. Yeah. <laughs> I love this one. I, I'm gonna. The seeing was not particularly good, and I'm still learning how to. I'm still unlike David. I'm. Uh, I'm still learning how to do this stuff. Sort of. Uh, um. And we're using like consumer equipment. Uh. But uh. It's just. It's wild to me how you can. Uh. Like the, the what, what blows my mind is the scale. Like a lot of these craters, you know, they're order like a couple hundred kilometers across, maybe, and tens of kilometers high. And like that just feels like such a human scale, like it's just mind boggling. Yeah, that's incredible. That's just incredible. Well, I'm glad you're throwing some uh, beautiful image there, Joseph. I'm glad you're Thank throwing you. some numbers out. You're welcome. Glad you're throwing some numbers out because here are some of the basics on the moon, and, and we're going to talk about this in more in more detail in, in upcoming episodes because we have the the uh, a beautiful total solar eclipse that is coming across North America 
uh, where, where Joseph and I are based on the East Coast and West Coast, hence coast to coast, uh, in early April. Uh, in fact, that, that's my uh, my third child's birthday on the 8th of April. Uh, Tennessee's going to be, oh my gosh, she's going to be 11. Gee whiz, now I feel old. Um, so anyway, <laughs> You're right. um, Sorry, man. Sorry, man. We got to go see a solar eclipse. <laughs> sorry, so solar eclipse time. Um, happy birthday later. Well, uh, so in terms of illumination, uh, the sun, for instance, is 398,000 times as bright as the full moon. So that gives you a sense that when sometimes you look at the full moon, and you're just blown away by how, how bright it is. It's dazzling. Well, the, the sun is 400,000 times brighter, essentially. So that's, uh, that, that's really interesting. Of course, one big difference is the, the sun produces its own light. The moon reflects sunlight. Um, so it's, it's not producing its own light. Uh, in terms of mass, there are 81 moons in the Earth, just in terms of mass, that's pretty big. Uh, distance is a good one, and I'm calling this mean distance, and I say mean because the orbit is not circular, it's slightly elliptical, it's about a 5% egg shape, it's not perfectly spherical, but it's mean distance, it's average distance from Earth is 238,855 miles. Which means traveling at the speed of light, if you if you could travel to the moon at the speed of light, it would take you 1.3 seconds more or less to get there. Wow. Which is amazing when you think about it. Amazing. Um, bearing in mind it takes 8.3 minutes from the light from the sun's surface to reach us. So uh, it's incredible. I think a better I think a better analogy that puts it in scale is it takes one, in one second light will circle the earth seven times. So this is like 15 times the Earth's circumference, which is already huge. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Now that brings us on to another cool little subtopic, and I, I want to carry on with you, the, the Mars's properties in a second, but I know you know a wee bit about uh, lunar ranging, so oh, yeah. tell us about that. So the question is, how do we, uh, uh, we have these estimates for the distance, right? It's like one, one point, one and a quarter light seconds away from the earth, 250,000 miles. How do we uh, know how far the, uh, away the moon is? And this is one of my favorite topics because it's, um, it's it makes it to me, it makes the heavens so accessible. Uh, so there's a thing called lunar ranging. Basically, um, when, uh, uh, the first uh, astronauts went up to the moon in 1969. They left these really, really big uh, reflectors uh, to reflect concentrated light back to the Earth. Um, and the idea is astronomers on the Earth would then hit those reflectors with a laser and measure using a detector how long it would take the light to come back. So, you know, there's light bouncing off the moon all the time from the sun, but you can shoot a laser, which is a very, very specific wavelength, and then collect the photons that are coming back basically at that wavelength uh, and sort of get exactly the light that you sent. Um, and you do this and you can measure the time between when you send the light and when it comes back. And uh, you end up finding that uh, the light takes about two and a half seconds to hit the moon. And so that means the moon is about a second and a quarter, sorry, 1.25 seconds or so away by light travel time, which is how we get these distance estimates so accurate. Um, but a, a really interesting question that I think people often ask is like the retro reflectors, you know, are probably the size of like a table. So how do we hit them? so precisely and this is like my favorite cool fact the answer is just we don't <laughs> it turns out that lasers when you you know you take your laser pointer and you shine it on a wall it parts this nice perfectly condensed little dot but if you move that wall away or you know you moved away from the wall uh as you get farther and farther away that dot's gonna spread as the dispersion of light becomes more apparent um and so when you're shining a laser beam at the moon it has to travel so far that by the time your standard laser beam hits the moon, it has dispersed so much that the size of the dot of the laser pointer would actually be greater than the surface of the, than the size of the moon as a whole or something comparable to it. So basically, as long as you just point roughly at the moon, you're guaranteed to hit it. And more accurately, you're guaranteed to hit the retro reflectors because the light is being spread yeah. out over the whole moon. And I just think that's the coolest thing. It's like that all these cool. little hacks and tricks that they thought of before they sent the astronauts up to the moon. And now you, you can do this. I mean, it's, it's not as accessible as like just taking a picture of the moon or uh, just, you know, looking at the, to, the, the moon through your telescope. But like, you know, with not the craziest equipment, you could uh, you do these kind of lunar ranging experiments. It's not, you know, off the shelf consumer hardware that you would need, but uh, it's more accessible than like traveling to the moon yourself or oh, stretching yeah. out a tape yeah. measure. So absolutely. Yeah. That's very cool. And also, you know, all the, all the little Martians on Mars that see the moon sort of blazing away like a crystal ball from those reflectors are probably thinking, ah, those Earthlings, it's party time again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. 
that would be their way to tell that there's life on earth and it's really dumb <laughs> yeah that's right. well, it's, it's not that dull we create a crystal ball a party ball from the moon. <laughs> sorry sorry that's their way of telling that there's life on earth and it's drunk as a skunk <laughs> that's right that's right it's, do, it's doing too many silly things uh, all right that's really really cool i i love i love that lunar ranging story um, Thanks, David. What else? It's you're welcome. What else? It's got a really cool fact about it, the moon, and it's it's because it's based on it on physics, of course, in that the rotation period of the moon, that's saying how long it takes to rotate on one axis, on its axis, is about 27 days. But it turns out its orbital period, the time for it to orbit the Earth, is also about 27 days, and they're very, very close. In fact, it's called synchronicity. And of course, one of the most obvious uh physical manifestations of that relationship is that you only ever see one side of the moon because as the moon is rotating around the earth it also is itself rotating and so of course the earth's rotating too and so from earthling from, from the earthling's point of view you only ever see one side of the sun it appears to be not rotating at all it's still orbiting but not rotating because the periods are matched so so well um, and that that could be actually one of the effects, as we mentioned this earlier on, about how eventually so uh, eclipses would be more difficult because the the Earth uh, the Moon is sort of leaking gravitational energy into the into the tidal movements. Is the rotation will probably slow down as well, so eventually that will go away. Well, I actually think that's how the Moon became tidally locked in the first place, right? Is uh, I think it's what's the explanation for the effect? Like the the Earth's gravity pulls on the near side of the Moon slightly more than on the far side, so over time that causes the rotation of the Moon to slow down, or something like that, um, and so eventually it becomes tidally locked. Was yeah, that the maybe, explanation? I forget if that's the. Oh well, no, that's a funky one. I think that the Earth, so that would only work well if the Earth, the Moon were, were compositionally uh, and density uniform, and I don't think that is true. Um, so actually, I think that is the that's at least the basic explanation that's given. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, that, that's the basic explanation that's given. Um, basically, the Earth's gravity very slightly tugs at the moon and uh, it applies a torque that slows the rotation, slows its rotation. And over four billion years, uh, tidal torque slowed the rotation and it eventually became tidally locked. Oh, so it's just in a transition period. It, it, eventually, it will just go out of synchronicity. Um, that's a good question, actually. I don't know if that's true. Well, eventually, it must be true. Well, one would imagine, if, it, as you mentioned earlier, the, the moon is pulling away from the Earth very, very slowly. Eventually, the distance will be so large that the gravitational effects will be low. Uh, we talked, but, we talked uh, about this last week with binaries, about them being tidally locked. Right. So, uh, but isn't tidal locking, isn't it uh, some sort of stable equilibrium? So it would be difficult to, uh, it would be it difficult. It is, ex except, yes, except in a system that's leaking gravitational energy, which the moon oh. is because of the oceans. So, so uh, I, know, I know all the other large moons in the solar system are also tidally locked with their planets. Um, and I feel like that feels like too much of a coincidence for it That's to also. <laughs> well, unless they go in and out of synchronicity often. Because of course they get oh. hit by things as well. Interesting. Yeah, okay. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. That's really interesting. I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head either. Hmm. Uh... <laughs> right, that's, that's a research topic for us. Yeah, we got well, to dig will... into that. Yep. Well, we, we as, as I mentioned, we will have a future episode on the moon because of this relationship with the um, <laughs> of eclipses. So we should, we and we will have a better it. answer for you then. <laughs> well, well, not only a better answer, we'll do what all good scientists do, and I'll go away and research it. Yeah, which I think is the right thing to do. Um. So, okay, I do want to touch on one quick thing because I think it relates directly to eclipses, which I think we can discuss briefly before we do our um our big big episode on this prior to the eclipse. Is that the or the orbit is slightly elliptical, which means it's not completely circular. Um, it has about a five percent ellipticity rate. Uh, it also is not coplanar with the solar system, the general solar system. And what that really means is, if here's the sun and here's the Earth, the moon is directly in line. So you don't have a nice line, Earth, a uh, moon, Earth, sun system. They're not lying on a straight line. It turns out that the orbit of the, uh, if that's the uh, ecliptic plane of the solar system, 
the moon, I'm exaggerating enormously here. That is the orbit of the moon. It's about 5% tilted. And of course, that explains very nicely why there aren't moon and solar eclipses every month. Is that, is it 5% tilted? It's 5%. I checked before we, we put this. Uh, is it, this I thought that was the 5% eccentricity of the orbit. They're both about 5%. Uh, they're both 5%. The number yeah. of coincidences with the moon and the sun is just like... Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a moon and the earth and the sun. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to this, whether it is to do with that, whether they are coupled, especially the fact that the moon is, has been hit by various things. But I, I don't know. That would be interesting to see if those two are coupled. We can check that too. Okay. And it is 5%. And what that means is that naturally is you don't get solar and lunar eclipses every single month, which is, I thought was really nice. You only get them when the, the, the moon and the earth pass through what are called nodes. Um, and I'm going to put some, I'm going to put some, I think we just, just discussed, we're going to put some teacher, some teacher notes in the comments below so that teachers um, can present some of these ideas to their students. And so given that we're thinking about eclipses, why don't, do you want to take us through uh, what this, this looks like a solar eclipse? Yeah. Uh, well, any eclipse uh, is basically an occultation, um, which uh, basically just means you have something passing in front of something else. Um, so in the case of a solar eclipse, the moon is passing between the sun and the earth and casting a shadow. In the case of a lunar eclipse, the earth is passing between the sun and the moon and casting a shadow. Actually, um, you can use the lunar eclipse to reconstruct the Earth's shadow. This is an excellent image uh, from a Redditor. So you can construct the shadow of the Earth, and this is how the Greeks knew that the Earth was round, um, uh, because they could see the rounded shape of the shadow of the Earth on the Moon. Uh, and so, uh, for the when the Moon passes between the Sun and the Earth, there's this very dark region where basically no light is getting through from the Sun, uh, and that produces the umbra of the uh, eclipse. But then there's an, a, a region where you get sort of a uh, uh, there's a region where you get like a more partial le letting in of light, and that's the penumbra. Uh, if the moon's not directing, blocking the light completely, because uh, some of the light from the sun can still get around it. Uh, and so, but basically, every eclipse, every occultation functions this way: you have light source, occulting thing, and the eclipse is the shadow being cast on the uh, on the object. Um, I regret not pulling this up beforehand, but we've actually made movies of. Uh, eclipses on other planets that you can do with your home telescope um oh, that would have been <laughs> i want to pull that up but uh uh okay, yeah so yeah. well maybe, yeah. maybe yeah sorry to interrupt yeah maybe for that for when we do the full episode for just before yeah. the eclipse in april we, we can um we should bring that in because that's a very nice work and it's also i think it's nice showing referenced work from from nasa or, or pearson education or you know these various um really nice sites that we, we visited but i think when we produce our own images it really does ram home the fact that we're not we, we're just doing we're doing these podcasts because we love astronomy we still we are still active in astronomy and this, yeah, is, this, is, it, our, yeah. this is our passion people ask that it's a fair question like why are you making an image of this thing you just go on google and find it it's like find better ones it's like it's not what it's about it's like i just we just enjoy doing this <laughs> so like... yeah i mean i think i think you and i have discussed this uh, i think you and i would do something like these podcasts even if nobody watched them because not that, a single so, person <laughs> because we we, we we talk about this kind of stuff when we talk about most sundays anyway it's like, oh, this <laughs> yeah is just, it's not just how we talk sometimes <laughs> Not to diminish the contribution of, our, of whatever viewers we have, but to be honest, guys, the idea was not to have a podcast. It was just to record the conversations we have anyway, <laughs> <We're> <laughs> rambling for hours to each other about the new space thing we heard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of true. Yeah, no. And well, hey, we... if you're listening this long, you're as guilty as we are. That's <laughs> right. That's right. You be careful. That's right. <laughs> um, so uh, you did throw just throw one one very very nice aspect you threw there right at the end that that Pearson yeah. education image. Uh, this I wanted to show because I think we're going to put I'm going to put it in the teachers' notes that we're going to prepare and and to distribute with these videos so that the teachers can present some of these ideas to their students so uh, in middle school and high school when they when they're doing their astronomy uh, segment. Uh, it turns out eclipses can be predicted. And they're predicted because there is an 18-year cycle of lunar and um, solar eclipses. And of course, you almost always get lunar and solar eclipses together, just because when one happens, it naturally two weeks later, the other one happens. Uh, but this is, a, this is an example from when I was teaching solar system at the University of Hawaii that I put together. This is a, they're called Saros cycles, these 18-year cycles. And each of these lines, each of these, these gray, green, and red uh, crimson lines you can see, are various 
types of eclipses that you can see uh, across the Earth's globe over a period of about, um, well, is it the full 18 years? I don't know if it is. Yeah, it's pretty close, uh, actually. Yeah, it is. Uh, the, the so, looking, yeah, it goes from see, 2008, 2005 to uh, well, no, look, 20... look down here in, Ant in Antarctica. It's 2003, oh, 2003 to, 2021. to 2021. Yep. Right. So I think, uh, I, think uh, I remember this one, in fact, yeah, this 21st of August, 2017. In fact, I observed this one in Oregon with my children. So this is, that was a, that was a total eclipse. I think the green Of the heart? Ones... Oh, that was lovely. Look at you bringing Bonnie Tyler into it. <laughs> very, very, very impressed, very impressed. Thank you, thank um, you. And then these others uh, uh, could be, uh, I'm not, I actually can't remember the exact uh, color scheme here, but the I think the annual eclipses were these two in, in, um, in Antarctica. The green ones. Uh, 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 no, the, the red ones. Oh, the greens are total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, but, but I, I, no, I there was an total... annular one. There was an annular one in 2023. I think these might just all be uh, total. Yeah, maybe they're just total then, yeah. I don't know yeah, because there there was an annular one in 2023 across the West Coast that I don't see. But the 2017 one, that was the 2017 Great American Total Eclipse. Yeah. Um, There's the one coming up in April, uh, which is um, yeah. Well, well, I'll be watching yeah. it hope, in uh, in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so you can get these maps of the cycles of of uh, eclipse systems uh, for the Earth, Moon, and Sun, and they repeat on about an 18 year cycle. So that was very, uh, very um, exciting. So um, yeah. So, so if you're I, curious I, I, about how, if you're curious about how astronomers predict this, and when they say, "Oh, this next eclipse is coming up, here's where to see it," we literally have the ability to uh, to predict this so accurately because um, yeah. we have such a good understanding of the Earth-Moon-Sun system. Yeah, the the orbital mechanics specifically. Mm -hmm.